Have you ever been broke? Oh yeah, 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 I have many times. Many times. You're yeah. serially broke. Seriously, yeah. <laughs> but like, then you always gain your money back. Yeah, and, yeah. But are, are you comfortable with that? How comfortable? How comfortable can you be with that? Well, you know, we came from nothing, so nothing doesn't scare me. They, everything's been the upside, so our family was very poor at one time. So coming from that side, having nothing, uh, it doesn't scare me. Mike Irish has been battling the odds throughout his life, but has found success as a real estate developer and as the Kim Chi King of Hawaii. Owner of Homs Enterprises and other businesses, Mike Irish, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha my kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. When life knocks Mike Irish down, he gets right back up again. When he broke his neck and became paralyzed as a young adult, he somehow learned to move and walk again, amazing the doctors. And when they warned him to restrict his physical activities, he lifted weights, body surfed, and entered triathlons. This fearlessness translated into Mike's approach toward business. When he nearly lost everything in several business ventures, he continued to risk it all and found success as the owner of Hom's Kimchi and other favorite local food brands. Growing up in the neighborhoods of Liliha and Kaimuki, Mike was introduced to the entrepreneurial spirit at a young age. Tell me about how life began for you. Where and oh. What was your family uh, like? Mother Korean, father Caucasian. Um, and part Irish? Oh yes, part <laughs> Irish, English, Scotch, Dutch, German, and uh, um, Queen's Hospital, uh, and raised for the first um, five years up in Liliha, and then moved to Kaimaki, uh, up by Leahi Hospital. And uh, that's where I went to Liho Leo Elementary, Kaimaki Intermediate, and then Kalani. And what did your parents do? What, what um, were they like? My mother, my father was an entrepreneur. He's always in doing business. He got into general contracting and developing. Mm -hmm. My mother was um, more of a stay-home mom. Uh, there were six of us. Um, they each had a child coming to the marriage, and they had four of us in the marriage. How many boys, how many girls? Three boys, three girls. Mm -hmm. And it goes boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. And so I'm the youngest boy. She, she had a business as well. Yeah, well, well I, I don't know if she had the business as well as my dad wanted her to have a business. You know, he wanted, because he loved business too. So he got her a little uh, ice cream parlor in Kapahulu called Dots, because na her name was Dorothy. And so they called it Dots, and everything was Dots, right? Mm -hmm. And the tablecloths and so forth. So she did that. We did that for, I think, about a year or two. Did you help out? <laughs> yeah, I'd go down and um, I'd take all my payout in yeah. ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and she paid well, right? I think that's why she ended up closing about a year and a half later. <laughs> All of us came down and ate more ice cream than we sold. Did she like doing it even though it wasn't her idea? Yeah, she did. She, she wanted to, you know, I think she, she wanted to experience that side of business to get a feel of what it feels like to not be able to sleep at night because you got to worry about all these different things rather than just getting up in the morning. She was a, a maid at the Moana. And so this was a, a little detour from there. Were they the kind of parents who'd sit you down and give you advice, or did you learn from them by watching? Or it was, really, you know, it was really funny is that um, by the time I was five, going on to six, they actually got divorced. Oh. So, but it wasn't like divorce where the father was not connected. He, you know, uh, he would always come come by, and and if we ever stepped out of line, she would call him, come home, and straighten us out, and we'd spend the weekends with him and so forth. And uh, what happened when I was about 13 at uh, my, my um, ninth grade year at Kaimaki Intermediate, my mother passed away. How old was she? She was 41. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you had a lot of loss early. Yeah, yeah, so, so it, it, you know, it, it was pretty tough, especially on us at that time. Where did you go to live with your father? No, actually he came to live, he moved back into the house. But then it's a little different, you know, because you're being raised by a Korean mother, right? Who's very, and then- Who's very what? Who, who, who very much takes care of the boys. <laughs> so, and then all of a sudden you have, a, uh, your father comes in who's Caucasian and uh, 
you know, everything's 50-50. We're all doing dishes, laundry, and, and it's, it's all new to us. And so it was really tough. There, there, was, a, 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 there was a little bit of rebellion there. On your part or everybody's everybody, part? I mean, it, everybody. It, it, the, first of all, the family's hurting. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's trying to find their own place. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we just, um, you know, try to find other areas. So we'd get into a little trouble, you know, you know, so, um, and that was just the way it was at that time. And uh, did the rebellion stop by the time you ended high school? Yeah, I think, I think it did. I think after, when, as you grow up, you find out that, you know, this is not what mom would want us to do. You know, what, were you doing? what were you doing anyway? What do you, what, I have to ask you in particular, what's a little trouble? Oh, well, you know, what happens when you have that much loss, you know, you, you have a lot of, of pain. So you go out and you, you in Kaimiki and so forth, so you'll get into a lot of fights and so forth, and it kind of feels good to have someone else hit you and so, feel a different type of pain. So you get into a lot of fights and and, and just and for no reason. Do you, you, you pick the fight? Oh, you can pick them, or they'll pick you. You know, everybody's territorial at the time. You know, this is this is our block or, or our area. You know, in in Kaimiki. Imagine that in Kaimiki. As Mike Irish graduated from Kalani High School in Honolulu, his athletic talent landed him a college scholarship. However, his life was about to take another unexpected turn. I was fortunate, I got um, a scholarship uh, to the University of Hawaii to play football. And um, freshman year, and uh, it's like we're two to three weeks into the season, and it's the last day before the day of the game. Now we're, we're fourth, fifth string, so you know we're never, but if we played well, we might be able to get sued up for the game, just to go run into the stadium. So everybody's playing pretty hard, and. Um, in those days, they taught us how to hit with our face, face mask in the numbers, which is now illegal. But you were actually taught that, to do it. We were it. taught to do that. It was a, and it was a great way to, I mean, you could really hurt somebody or get hurt, as I found out. And uh, that's what happened. I ended up hitting a, someone and uh, it snapped, it broke my neck. And uh, so I was paralyzed from the neck down. And I thought it was a stinger. I thought, you know, it's one of these things you wait, shake off. And I even, when I got to the hospital, I said, you know, guys, I got a game tomorrow. Is there something we can take? You know, because I'm waiting for this thing to wear off. And that's when the doctor told me, he says, you know, you should be grateful you're even alive. According to the x-rays, you've fractured your number one vertebrae, which means, you know. Where is that? Which one that, is that's it? That's a top. The top one. Which controls breathing and everything. And, and it's amazing that you're still alive. I said, okay. And, and, and that was the good news. The bad news was, but you'll probably never walk again. And I said, excuse That's me? devastating. Yeah. He says, you're, you're, you're paralyzed from the neck down, but you're, you're alive. And that's, that's, why would I want to be alive? <laughs> paralyzed from the neck down, why would I want to be alive? So, so um, anyway, about three months after the injury, they sent me to rehab. I went to rehab about two and a half weeks after they stabilized me at Queens, and then I went to the rehab. What would have gone through your mind those two and a half weeks? Oh, in the two and a half weeks, you go through. Well, um, you, you refuse to believe, and you know, so you're still on this. You, you know, I'm not real depressed yet. I'm just a little scared, and um, but the mindset is that I'll get over this. Yeah, I get you over know, everything. Get, yeah, right. And so, so. Um, then they, they didn't even bother to do the surgery on me. They just put me in a halo and moved me to um, rehab. And at rehab, for some reason, my feelings started to come back. Hmm. And after about three months at rehab, I actually walked out with a, with a walker, but then went back to Queens for the surgery. And how, why, do they know why your feelings came back? Were you working no, out? No, they just said, they, they, they never knew how damaged, they, they can just tell by how I was at that time. The technology in 71 isn't as what it is today. But in 71, they, they looked at me and just said, you're, you're paralyzed, you know what I mean? You know, and then, then they found out that maybe one out of a million might come out of this. And uh, I, I guess I was, I, I was just fortunate. So 
that that makes me even enjoy life a little more no every day. So then you went to, into surgery to, to fuse? fuse. They fuse number one, two, and three vertebrae. That's why I have a lack of mobility in my neck. But I'll take that over. You can't swivel your neck? No, no. Oh. Uh, but everything else came back? Yeah, everything else came back. Yes. And that was how long after? Um, it, it went into a body cast, everything. It, it took about two years. Two years you yeah. were sidelined? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, no football scholarship after that. No, because in those days, it's not like today. If you get hurt while you're on scholarship, the, the school has to pay for your school. Over there, I only had a six, you know, you have a uh, semester scholarship. If you do well, make the team, you get, you know. Oh. So evidently, I didn't make the team. <laughs> wow. So, how did that change you, do you think? Oh, well, you know, it, it just makes you appreciate a lot of things, you know. It could have made you bitter. I lost yeah. my chance at school because you didn't go to oh, college right. after that. No, no, I couldn't. You, you didn't get bitter? And, and what about friends? Did they hang with you? Oh, I tell you what, it, it brought so many friends to me. Really? I mean, Kalani dedicated a game to me. Uh, the, um, University of Hawaii had a game dedicated. They gave me the team footballs. Uh, I mean, the, the support was, was, you know, so much there that that kept me going. And once I was able to um, get well again, uh, you know, I, I couldn't thank all those people that have supported me enough. In fact, that's why today I, I sit on the um, rehab board. Oh. That's one of the reasons. When they ever, I said, if they ever asked me to do anything, I'd do it. And about 10 years ago, I think they asked me if I'd sit on their board. I said, absolutely. After his injury and stunning recovery, Mike Irish turned his attention to real estate development, something he dabbled in from a young age really young. Oh, my plan was I thought I'd go to college, but I always thought I'd be this big time developer, you know, like the Chris Hemeters and, and all these guys, and that was my dream. But be Because you wanted to be a negotiator or you wanted to be rich or, or all of these? Oh, I, I loved real estate ever since I was a kid. Uh, I, I, I was involved in real estate ever since I was like eight or nine years old. With, with your father? Uh, no, actually I bought my own piece of real estate. You when, did? Yeah, uh, my dad took me to, a, my dad sent me because he kept getting harassed to the seminar at the Hilton where you get steak and lobster and you just listen to the show and it was for lots to buy in Florida. And uh, so I sat there and I was just amazed. And all, how old are, were you? I Eighth was, grade, uh, you no, 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 I was eight years old, eight or nine eight. years old. And I, I was always selling, I was always doing something. I was, I was always trying to make money, for, for, according to my family. What did you sell? I, I'd sell newspapers, but not, you know, I'd sell newspapers when I was four or five years old, not because I would watch people make money selling newspapers. So I'd sell all these newspapers, not knowing that they were three weeks old. Because <laughs> yeah, you don't know that as a kid, but would you want to buy a paper? <laughs> you just see people oh, buy. Oh, cute little boy, yeah, of course I would. Yeah, that's exactly how it worked out. You know, so, so I bought some, I ended up buying a couple lots, and my father had to co-sign for me. I thought this was interesting. How, how could you afford the business? Did you save oh, money? Oh yeah, I worked on the weekends at Chinatown for uh, uh, in, uh, the Yama Brothers uh, food stand, and then we'd work five in the morning to five in the evening on Saturdays, and five to two on Sundays, and then they'd pay you maybe between nine to eleven dollars, and then so the, I knew I had like forty dollars a month. And then during the um, summers, I'd work construction uh, for my dad's company. And then you didn't blow it, you saved it. Oh, no, I, what I did was actually I made payments. I already had, I had oh. a mortgage. I bought two lots for $25 down, each lot, $25 down, $25 a month for $2,500. So I bought two of them. And uh, then about three years later, I, I got a call. And uh, so now I'm 12. So I'm already all grown up. <laughs> Your voice is getting dark, yeah. deeper. And so um, the, they asked if I'd like to sell the lots back. I said, well. Were they surprised to hear a 12-year-old on the other end of the line? No, my dad just gave him the phone. He says, you want to talk to my son? Because you know, I was on title, but he was my co-signer. So they heard this, and he says, well, we'll give you 5000 for each one of your lots. I said, well, what about the three years I paid the $25? He says, okay, we'll give you that back too. Will you sell? I said, sure. A year later, they announced Disney World. <gasps> but it was okay because I made my money back. That's Oops. good. That's hey. great. And I, what we did was we took that money, rolled it onto some land on the Big Island. And then what'd you do with that? 
Actually, that, that became the, the downfall because my dad was a developer and constantly, he, he, was a, he, he, was at, he always risked everything. And um, he ended up going bankrupt and because he co-signed and had to own that land, that land was part of his bankruptcy when he filed. Uh, how so old were you then? Then I was, now I'm probably like uh, 19, 20. Uh, but it was okay, it, you know, because it was, it really was money that, although I made, you know, it, it, it's paper. While Mike Irish was a struggling real estate developer, an unexpected business venture presented itself. Mike then made a risk-it-all decision that would lead to success in a very different type of industry. I, I worked for my father's company and found out how he bought and sold real estate and so forth and uh, how he was doing things. And it was pretty interesting. So I think I learned more doing that than I would at any classroom. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, you, be, you started acquiring other kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I was sitting, uh, because the development wasn't going that well. When what I was year was this? But, um, we're going now from about 80 to 83, 84, and I tried to do development full time. And uh, I got caught at the wrong time where interest rates were just skyrocketing, 18% oh, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so I got caught up in that. And, and then, uh, I bought this um, Parks brand products because I wanted a cash flow business, a little business that could cash flow. And so I bought this Parks brand products, which I had no knowledge of. Food, uh, they made sauces, barbecue sauces, kochujang, tegu. And I had no, you know, no idea of how to, but I thought, oh, I can learn this. And uh, boy, I was losing everything. And uh, then I found out Ham's kimchi was for sale. And I thought, well, if I put all the last dollar I have into Ham's kimchi, then it goes broke <laughs> again. I, I'm where I started from anyway. So um, I bought Ham's and put the two together and the synergy started to work. So now we fast forward 30 some odd years. And since then, all these, and most of the companies, they have come to me to purchase. I've never had to go to them when they found out I bought Homs and Kohala came, it's all these other different companies. And these companies. are local cult-like, yeah. cult yeah. you know, just very iconic brands. Yeah, and we don't, and it's really funny, it, we keep it that way so everybody still thinks it's still that little old lady here or that little person on Big Island, Kohala, and we want them to still believe. And we follow their recipes to the T, so everybody thought, oh, so you have the same kimchi, you know, each one is made differently. And, and uh, each one is unique in its own style. And they're all made in the same place. They're all made in the same place. For now. that synergy. For the synergy and distributed uh -huh. for the synergies. And our buying power is stronger. So that, that sort of helps it. So how many have you bought up, these brands that have, have uh, great significance locally? Kimchi brands, I think we have nine kimchi companies, two Takawan companies, and four sauce companies under the name, un, uh, in the Hams brand. And then you have Kyoki's Lalo and Kalua Pig. And then we have Diamond Head Seafood. When these um, families come to you and they say we're gonna retire the, the brand or mm -hmm. the, the, the company, is it because they can't make it work or the family has decided not to take yes, it to the next generation? Yeah, yeah. That's basically it. The kids, the kids have gotten up every morning at 5.30, 5 o'clock, label bottles, had to come home right after school to pack kimchi in the garage or in the, the, the houses. And uh, so the, the um, kids, when they, they want to do anything else but kimchi. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they want to get as far away from, you know, having to do that. Well, is, it, is it usually second generation or third generation that says, uh, I don't think so, second? Second. Because, they, they're, you know, um, yeah, I haven't seen the first where they made it, made it good. They send all the kids to Ponoho, they send all, you know, and that generation is saying, well, no, I'll, Dad, I'm, I'm an attorney. Close right. it down, I'll no take care labels. of you. I, I'll take care of you. Uh, you know, don't worry about it. Shut it down, I'll take care of you. You know, so it comes mostly in that fashion. So these brands would have all died. I, I would, I think so, yeah. Didn't you change the, um, the packaging of it? No, actually I haven't. I, 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 well, they were all glass before yes. I went to plastic. I just, the glass was just too heavy. 
and too hard. And what happens, because <laughs> we're mixing them in vats, and when they're making it, once they drop a bottle and crack it in the vat, you have to destroy the whole vat. Oh. So it became we need plastic bottles. And, and was that a switch for the consumer or did that go over just fine? I think it went over just fine. I, I, I fought it for years. I, I really did. I, I, I fought it. I thought, no, it should be in glass jars and you know this mm -hmm. and that. And then when all of a sudden they, they, the economics didn't work, the shipping costs and then the, the taxing on the, the glass and so forth that, that we do here. Uh, then all of a sudden the economics didn't work because then kimchi would get too expensive. So I thought, okay, let me try this with one brand. And we saw actually a little bit of an increase in sales because now the parents could take it, put it in their carts, and it didn't have to worry about dropping the bag and breaking it or something. Mm -hmm. did, did the kimchi purchases have anything at all to do with your being half Korean? No, actually, no, I didn't. But, but um, because... The lady that introduced me was Korean, was Chicken Alice. She told, she's the one who told me, and Chicken she, Alice. Chicken Alice, Alice Gethinen. She's the one who told me go buy Parks brand products because it was a secret to her. Chicken Alice, it was she took that mix, so she adopted me as her kid brother because I'm half Korean. So she, she, she both myself and my brother Billy. Mike Irish forged a distinctive path to success in the business world, and along the way, he gained the guidance of several top Hawaii business leaders. Do you have mentors, advisors? I have great employees. I have some great employees. Um, my mentors, um, uh, one of them was Richard Kimmy from the um, Hukila Hotels. You know, I, I, I listen to a lot of people. Um, Wesley Park mm -hmm. is, is a good mentor. So there's a lot of people that help me and that I listen to. Um, even every now and then, even Walter Dodds will give me advice. So I'm, I'm very grateful for all the, mm -hmm. the people that help me. And uh, of, of the names you just mentioned, has anyone given you advice that you could share? Oh, um, yeah, I've gone to them on deals. I, you know, I've gone to um, Walter Dodds. I'd ask him, what do you think about this deal? He says, nope. Then I listen. Okay, I don't. <laughs> what, what advice do you give people uh, who, who, who want to make a dent in the business scene? And you know, you, you've done it your own way. Um, what would you tell them that might, might differ from what maybe a business school would say? I think um, my brother once told me, he said, you know, it's funny. The harder you work, the luckier you are. It's, if you're willing to work hard and, and put in the time and effort, uh, you can do it. Because everybody looks at this, but when, we, when I was first starting, you know, you're there at 4 in the morning mm -hmm. and you're leaving at 6 at night and you're working six, seven days a week. And you know, so all of a sudden they see this and they say, oh, this is fun. But I go back to those days and it, you know, where I'm the one mixing the kochujang. I'm the one mixing the, the tegu. And, and, and you don't know if it's gonna work no, out no, no, for you no, either. And, and I only have one, two other employees besides myself. And I'm the one delivering and driving and, and setting up the stores. And even when we bought Hams, I was my own delivery man. I imagine a, a former quadriplegic is yeah. in is in Homs, yeah. mixing and mixing, yeah. carrying, carrying and lugging. Yeah. Actually, that's the doctors wanted me to stay on. They said, "Well, what you have to do after you have to stay with rubber shoes and you can't lift anything over 20 pounds." But I, and then no sudden movements and so forth. But I went back to you know from Kalani, so I went back to body surfing, I went back to playing racquetball, weightlifting, and so during and I did. Um, I did about four, five, ten men in, in um, 95 to 201, I think it was, something like that. Wow. And w was there anything you could have done to strengthen your neck, or, or, or maybe no, that was it? Just that, use it, yeah, right? Yeah, I figured, he said, well, you know, the next time it breaks, you know, this is why I didn't think I'd get this far anyway. <laughs> Seriously? So, yeah. so, I mean, because all that yeah. sounds like a risk. And, yeah, and, it is, uh, it is. But, but you know, you, you want to, if I lived, a life in shelter and just said, okay, this is what I got to do. And I was scared of everything. I wouldn't be able to do anything I really enjoyed. So, you know, it really becomes the quality of life. What, what do you want in your life? Do you want quality or do you want longevity? You mentioned that your father was really influential. He, he passed away at a young age, yeah. not as young as your mom, but he no, was not. He's not 68. A... He passed away at 68. So yeah. I was only about 33, I think, at the time, 34. Yeah. yeah. 
So, so, um, but his buildings are still standing, like he said. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think of. I mean, your your life has had a lot of loss. Oh, but it's, it, it, it yeah, but it's been pretty rich. I've got great brothers and sisters. I've got a great wife. Uh, you know, um, I, I got great people that I work with in, in our factories, and um, you know, I, I I couldn't have asked for better. You know, facing the fact that I wasn't ever going to walk again, I'm I'm from that point I'm really ecstatic. <laughs> What do you want in life? Do you risk it all to get what you want, or do you take the safer path? Mike Irish's recovery from paralysis caused by a football injury helped him realize that taking risks could actually lead him to a greater measure of security and happiness. These days, Mike may not take as many financial risks as he once did, but he continues to run his company and his life with a sense of fearlessness. Mahalo to Mike Irish of Honolulu for sharing his story with us. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. And is the, the market still there for several brands of kimchi? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because everybody has a certain style that they like. No different than clothing. Yeah. <laughs> no different than clothing. Everybody has a certain style that they like, and, 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 it, and they'll change.